Good morning, church. Our teaching text is from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 19 in the ESV. And it reads as follows. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they laid him by the hand, they led him by the hand, and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Dam Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he, he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the, with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell off his eyes, and rega he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. This is the word of the Lord. My name is Lesejo, and I have the privilege of serving the body of Christ through Fellowship City, and in this, this morning in particular, bringing the word of God to you. We have been in season two of Acts, so over the last few weeks, we have come to experience, see, and be reminded about the compelling gospel, which should also compel us to continue living, continue moving, continue proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the fifth episode in season two, and so far, Acts has been the gift that has kept on giving, bringing us into the stories after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, seeing the gospel grow, seeing the gospel needing more hands and people to put up their hands in place to further the work of the gospel. We've also been introduced to different characters like Stephen, Simon, Philip, and the Enoch, we can learn and identify with these characters, as well as be encouraged to continue witnessing, continue being proactive. If you've missed any of these episodes, feel free to catch them on YouTube or on your favorite podcast platform. This week, we're looking at, uh, we're looking at the conversion of Saul through Acts 9. Uh, we would have heard or first been introduced to Saul in Acts 7, we will understand a little bit more about Saul and then see the conversion and see comments. So that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to look at three points. The context, the conversion, and comments around that conversion and the context. But before we get into that, let me pray for us. Let me ask God by his Holy Spirit to help us this morning as we engage with his word. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that this morning we can come together, we can fellowship with one another, we can sing songs of praise and worship to you, that we can sit and through your Holy Spirit that you would speak to us. I pray that now as I, as I bring your word to your people that you would work in my heart and work in theirs, that you would enable us to be reminded of who you are and be encouraged by that. 
We pray that through your Holy Spirit that you'd be with us and tell us those things that you'd want us to know, to say, and to do. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are first introduced to Saul in Acts 7, as I mentioned. <coughs> he was present at the stoning of Stephen in chapter 8, and we also see that he was approving of this. He continued to ravage the church. That is what we're seeing in chapter 8. He continued to round up people and commit them to prison. This is Saul. Verse 1 of chapter 9 continues this depiction of Saul. It says, but Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. To understand why Saul is depicted this way, we need to know Saul a little bit better. So Acts 22 verse 3, from that passage we know that Saul is a Jew, that he was born in Tarsus in Sicilia, which is modern day Turkey. We know that he studied under a rabbi, a teacher named Gamaliel, who taught Saul Jewish history, taught Saul Psalms, and taught Saul about the prophets. We see also in Acts 26 verse 5 that he was a Roman citizen. We see and experience this because he's being flogged, and this is how he responds, that he's a Roman citizen. Philippians 3, verses 4 to 6, we see that he is a Pharisee, and the word Pharisee comes from a Hebrew word, which means separated. So Pharisees were people who thought they were separate from everyone else. They were known for their personal sense of dutifulness and obedience in the law. Their belief is that all Jews should observe and be obedient to all 600 plus laws from the Torah. Saul then says he is the Hebrew of Hebrews in regards to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. If there was an award, basically he would be the biggest winner of that award. Saul has a zeal to prosecute those who blaspheme against God, those who say Jesus is God. He believes that he's doing what is right to persecute those who are against his belief, like he did or as part of the persecution of Stephen. That is the context. So as we dig into the conversion, it is good to maybe understand what that word means. Loosely, the word con co convert is to change from one character type or purpose to another. Like converting centimeters to meters, or converting rands to dollars, that is if you have enough rands, <laughs> or, or converting petrol to il electric. So not sure if it is wise, maybe we need to ask Sikonati Machancha, the uh, ESCOM spokesperson, if we should be converting to, to electric. But that is converting. So converting petrol to electric, rands to dollars, or centimeters to meters. So the Bible paints the picture of the word convert, meaning returning to what we were initially meant to be. Like moving from eating McDonald's to Steers, or Orlando Pirates to Kaiser Chief supporters, where you should be. <laughs> so Saul changed from a prosecutor of Christians to being an advocate, a disciple of Jesus Christ, and a writer of a large part of the New Testament. Acts 9 shows the story of Saul's conversion, and we see three parts to that conversion. We, we, we see a clash, verses 1 to 5. We see darkness, verses 6 to 9. And we see acceptance in verses 17 to 19. So clash, 1 to 5. Darkness, 6 to 9, and acceptance, 1 to 19. Those are the three parts of the conversion of Saul. I believe that everyone who is a believer would encounter some of these three steps to conversion. I don't think it's necessarily a recipe, but these steps would happen, maybe in slightly different order, but they would happen in someone's conversion. So let's look at the first one. Let's look at clash. Saul is faced with a clash between what he believes in God and who God really is. Saul had a preconceived view of who God should be according to all that he had been taught. 
and the lens in which he wanted to experience God. He is knocked to the ground when he encounters Jesus, when he encounters a bright light. His view of reality, his view of who God is, is challenged at that very moment. The view he had clashes with the reality he's in. Verse 3 says, Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, So, so, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. What is evident here is that Saul is encountering a deity that is bigger than him, or bigger than his reality, which is why he says, Who are you, Lord? He ends that to say, Lord, at the end of that statement. Saul hears a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? That is a strong statement. Jesus has an identity which is so tightly linked with his people that he's linking the persecution of his people directly with the persecution of himself. Jesus is saying to Saul, you're not only persecuting my people, but you are directly persecuting me through your acts against my people. As a parent, if you stop your children from a fight, very rarely or never do we insert ourselves in the middle. Never would we ask the one or the other, why are you persecuting me? That would be mind-boggling to them. As a sibling, you might have had either a good or a bad relationship with your cousin or your brother or your sister, but you would likely defend them against anyone trying to hurt or harm them. It would be like inserting yourself in the situation so closely by linking the hurt or harm against them as if you have been directly physically harmed. So Saul had thought of and wanted to believe Jesus as a Jesus who fits his beliefs, a God who would not become a human to walk around on earth. In his understanding and upholding of temple sacrifices, he didn't want to believe in a God who would eradicate the practices that he follows so closely or so religiously. He thought he knew who God was as he was taught the law. Saul was persecuting Christians because he thought he was right in his beliefs of who God is and the Christians and Jesus were wrong. They were blaspheming against God and he had to defend his beliefs. He had to defend God and his acting in the will of God. Here in verse 5, his view of God clashes with his encounter with the real God, Jesus Christ. Verse 6 says, But rise and enter the city, and you'll be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. So literal darkness falls upon Saul. He could not see. He spent three days without sight, neither eating nor drinking. I don't think we see an immediate change or conversion from Saul. It's not sudden. Jesus didn't say, kneel before me, Saul, and ask me into your heart or repeat after me as I pray. Saul's clash and initial encounter with God does not seem to instantly change his heart. But why the blindness? Why the blindness? It's a good question. One could say because he is in spiritu- he's, spiritual blind, he's spiritually blind, but that would be speculative. I think God uses blindness here to enable soul to be still. Enabling soul to think and to reflect. Think of this as a time of reflection and fasting. That is what soul could do. That's all soul could do for three days. Encountering Jesus who clashed with his beliefs of who God is, he was faced with real loss of sight. He spends his time reflecting. Saul was rethinking his understanding of who God is. Saul, as a Pharisee, expected a Messiah that would be blessed by God, a Messiah that would be loved by God. If you think about the death of Jesus on the cross, it may seem that he was not blessed 
or loved by God. It would seem that he was alienated, that the Messiah was rejected by God at first glance. This would be tough for Saul to comprehend, expecting a Messiah that was loved by God and perceiving a Messiah that was alienated or rejected by God. It would be like having known all your life that a tomato is a vegetable, but learning that it's actually a fruit. (laughs) That is hard to hear. Or like those who would know uh, Rowan Atkinson as as Mr. Bean, Um, you only know that he grunts and he has a handful of words, but then experiencing him talk for the first time (laughs) and hearing his vocabulary Saul likely in those three days had time to reflect on Jesus, on who Jesus was. That in fact Jesus was raised from the dead. That Jesus in fact conquered death instead of what he had believed he saw on the cross. That maybe the rejection or the words, Lord, why have you forsaken me, aren't the Messiah speaking of himself, but the Messiah taking on our sin, taking on our place. The Messiah was not rejected, but we were rejected, and he was being punished for our sin. He was cursed for somebody else's sin, our sin. That's game-changing. One of my favorite movies is Inception. So when watching Inception or similar kind of movies with a deep plot, you get, you get into a moment through the movie that makes you want to pause and, and reflect on what has happened before. As your eyes and or your brain catches up with the movie. When you get an aha moment, a moment that makes you consider everything that's come before and that's, come af- that's coming after, that gives you a little bit more clarity, that's all right here. Pausing and reflecting on what's come before and with a little bit more clarity, understanding what's come before and would help in his understanding of what comes after. Saul right here is understanding that the Messiah was loved, not cursed as it seemed, that the Messiah was vindicated from the accusations made against him, accusations that he was blaspheming against God. He was there at the crucifixion. He knew about the empty tomb, so this is coming back to him as he's reflecting on God that the empty tomb was there. He sat through Stephen's explanation about Moses and Jesus, And a penny is dropping in Saul's mind. Saul would then maybe reflect on Isaiah. Maybe reflect on Isaiah starting speaking about a strong Messiah, a strong king. And ending with a suffering servant who dies for the transgressions of the people. Then Isaiah suddenly starts to make more sense. Brings more clarity. And there's his answer. The Messiah is Jesus. Who is a strong Messiah and king and ends as a suffering servant who dies for the transgressions of his people. As a Pharisee, practices of sacrifice for sin are a big part of his belief and practices. Maybe he reflects on this not quite making sense anymore and trying to understand this. A light bulb goes off. The sacrifices were pointing to Jesus. Saul expecting a strong God to send a strong Messiah to save anyone who obeyed, anyone who lived up to the law, like himself, who defended the law, but now understanding that he is witnessing a strong God who sent a strong Messiah to save the weak, to save those who can't live up to the law, like himself. Just a quick side road, another reason why Saul's conversion was not an instant one, we see in Acts 26, where he he recalls the same story about his conversion. Paul retells it and says, And when he had fallen on the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Jesus here, as Paul tells us, used a Greek proverb that Jews understood in relation to agriculture. A goad was a stick with a pointy piece of iron that was used to that was used to direct an ox or sheep towards the right direction. If an ox would rebel and kick against the goad, it would hurt even more. The more they would suffer. 
What does Jesus mean here? I think he's referring to points in Saul's life where he would have seen and experienced his need for God. I think through, through, through these three days, this would be happening. He would be kicking against or pushing against Jesus because of what he knows or what he thought he, he knows or what he was taught. He would be kicking against what he's experiencing and seeing. I think another reason would be that Saul says in Romans 7, Paul speaks about the law and sin in Romans 7. He zones in on the last of the Ten Commandments, one that would be harder to follow. Romans 7, verse 7 starts off by saying, What then shall we say, that the law is sin by no means? Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. Because the commandments of the Pharisees were what the Pharisees followed. They believed they were doing it. They believed they were upholding it. They believed they were keeping God's law. Paul then reflects on the tenth. You shall not covet. To covet is to wish for something so intently that you're discontent. So basically to love God and never be discontent. That's the commandment. Love God and never be discontent. That is hard. This is what it means to covet. To wish for a white BMW 3 Series with tinted windows, which normally parks by the Children's Discipleship banner. To want it so much that you're discontent. To want to know the feeling of driving so close to the floor that you can touch it. <laughs> to know the speed, but knowing your car isn't quite the same. Or to wish to be a lawyer or a CA so much that you hate your job. Or to covet a house in Blue Crane on De Huervis, which is near a big park, exclusive walkway, and because they don't have load shedding. Because your most used phone app is Escom Push. That's coveting, to want something so much, to be discontent with what you have. So Paul would have maybe reflected on the Ten Commandments and realized that he needs a savior. He does covet, that he can't fulfill the law as he thought, and that he needs a savior. This may be one of the goals. First clash, darkness, and then acceptance. Verse 17 says, So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother, Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. God calls Ananias in verse 10 to go and lay hands on Saul. And he has already heard about Saul. Saul having Christians killed and arrested, and he is worried that he too will be taken by Saul. We see this in verses 13 and 14 of Acts 9. But Ananias, however, is obedient and he goes to Saul. When he does, he lays his hands on him and Saul regains his sight. The laying of hands here is significant. It is an embrace. It is a level of intimacy that you would feel maybe if someone is laying their hands on you and praying for you. And he's being called brother as well. Calls him brother. That is belonging. That is the embrace that, he's, that Saul is feeling as Ananias is coming to him. When you see that you need a savior, that you need God, his hands are open. He wants to embrace you. He accepts you. He loves you no matter what you have or have not done. God has made a way to reconcile Saul to himself. He has accepted and embraced Saul. I was not born into a Christian family, so just before I gave my life to Jesus, I experienced a slash. I experienced a moment when I realized that my view of God was wrong. He isn't only for some, but that he wants 
need to be his as well. That he wasn't detached, that was my view, but that actually he is present and a loving father. I experienced the darkness when I sat in my seat and heard the gospel preached for the first time, that Jesus died for me, that he loves me and he has a plan for me. That gave me a clearer picture of my identity, which I had lacked. A clearer picture of hope, which I didn't have. And belonging. That's the darkness that I sat through. Reminding me of words that C.S. Lewis uses about his conversion. He uses words, he says, I felt him so close, I felt him close in on me. Him becoming clearer. I felt him closing in on me and him becoming clearer. Felt his embrace as he accepted and embraced me. I believe that during the, a point of conversion, many people reflect on God, reflect on the God they wanted or the one they had made up and see that this God isn't the real God. Maybe some teaching that they have heard or have been hearing whenever they went to church or read the Bible comes to mind and then it informs and helps a light bulb to, to light up. They start to see Jesus as the Messiah, as a suffering servant who was loved by God, who took on our sin and was cursed for us on the cross. I want to make a few observations from the text and Paul's conversion. Saul's conversion was completely the work of God. God took over on the road to Damascus. God was not responding to what Saul had done. God was sovereign, meaning God showed all authority to save Saul. It was completely free. He made a way. His grace found Saul just as he was, empty-handed, but made alive by God. Saul in the darkness was also reflecting, praying, and again seeing and experiencing Jesus. We go through times of darkness as well. Those are times when we should pray, when we should reflect, when we should be still, when we should be reminded about who God is. Jesus suffered, crucified. Forgiveness is in him. He descended into darkness and rose in glorious light. Those are the words of the song we sang just now. I felt this week that even though as a, as a country, uh, things are bubbling at the surface with so many things happening around us. And some of those things are happening in us. We should be encouraged that we can lay it all down before God. That God is sovereign, that God is in control. We should be praying like we see Saul. Reflecting on who God is, being reminded or coming to now understand who God is and praying. That's what we should be doing. Because God is sovereign and he is in control. So lay all your burdens before him and pray. The last comment is, Paul's conversion is for you. God's act in saving Paul should give you hope that God can convert you and he can convert others. That God saves everyone. 1 Timothy 1 verse 12 to 16 says, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that I am in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason. That in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. So Paul's, Paul's conversion is for you. To see that God saves. He can save you and he can save others. God showed sovereign grace to Paul. Doesn't matter that Paul was ravaging the church. He was breathing threats. He was an extremist. He was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent. But God showed him grace. God showed him mercy and patience. Mercy to a man who didn't deserve it. Who persecuted Christians. God could have taken Paul out or could have taken Saul out when he was part of the stoning of Stephen, but he didn't. God was patient. This should bring you hope. Hope for yourself and hope for others. Hope for others that you're praying for would come to believe. 
as we close, you may be soul sitting here or listening on YouTube or on audio podcasts. You may be someone who doesn't live for or know Jesus Christ as Lord. You may know him as provider or healer. This is true of God that he is a provider and healer. But if you don't know him first as Savior, then he is just a God you're creating. Just like Saul, who created a version of God that he liked. I'll use the words of Murandeni last week. Stop, stop what you're doing. Take time to reflect on who Jesus is. He is a strong Messiah, sent by a strong God to save weak, confused, broken people. I was one of those people and he saved me through his death on the cross. He was not cursed on the cross. He took up the curse, our curse. He was not rejected. He took our rejection on himself. Jesus was loved by God and Jesus loves us. He loves you and he loves me. Sometimes I have to say that to myself when I forget. You may be sitting here and you may know Jesus as Lord and Savior. You may be an Ananias. Maybe you aren't obedient to God. Maybe you aren't the hands and feet of God as we see Ananias here. Maybe you are detached from your context and living in your own world. I encourage you to see that obedience, what obedience does in this case. Obedience shows love and embrace to others. It points them to Jesus. So be proactive. Look at the city you are in. There may be souls and Ananiases around you. Are you calling or sharing the gospel with the souls? Are you encouraging the Ananiases to be salt and light? The words we sang should be true of us all the time. We sang, I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. These words should ring true of us all the time. I think we can, sitting here, be the Ananias, bring in the gospel if you are a believer. And where you struggle, his grace is sufficient for you. His grace will find you where you are. Be encouraged that you don't have to do it alone that you have brothers and sisters around you to help you to be obedient to the call of God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that this morning we can be reminded that you are sovereign. That you are Lord and that you are in control. reminded that you have made a way if we believe in you to draw us closer to yourself. I pray that if we don't know you or if we know or have preconceived versions of who you are that you would show those to us. That you would make it clear to us that we do not know you as Lord and Savior and that you would pull us nearer to you. We should know you first and foremost as our Lord and Savior. We thank you that it was, as we see the conversion of, of Saul, that you were at work through that. That you helped him to be still, to reflect on you. And I pray that if we don't know you, that's what would happen. That we'd be still and reflect upon you. I pray that even as we do know you, that we will take a moment to be still and reflect on you, be reminded again of who you are, that you are Jesus, the Messiah, the one who loves us, who came and died for us. We pray, Lord, that as we reflect on these words, as we reflect on Jesus, the Messiah, as we reflect on a strong God, who sent a strong Messiah to save a weak people, that we will be encouraged and edified, that you would continue to stir these words up in our hearts. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.